Well, number 12 in our list of uh, bad doctrines or bad beliefs, unbiblical teachings that are often presented as being biblical, is the denial of Christ's return. Um, and that may sound like completely outside of any kind of tradition within Christianity, but actually there are people who do that, particularly within the Roman Catholic Church, it's the idea that there isn't going to be a literal second coming of Jesus, but rather there's going to be a restoration of the earth by the church. And this is really a view that's held both by uh, the Roman Catholic Church, but also you find it in some uh, charismatic groups like Bethel and so forth, who uh, the, the new apostolic reformation we talked about before, uh, they basically, uh, look at the time frame which in, we're in right now and say we are in that millennial period right now that not a literal thousand years it refers to just a generalized time between the resurrection of Christ and until he sets up his kingdom and of course we become key in setting up the kingdom so the Roman church basically says that if you want to get to heaven and you have to be first born again and then accepted within the church that when it's your acceptance into the Roman Catholic Church that is the seal of salvation. Believe on Jesus and become a Catholic, and then you can be saved. Um, the doctrine has given a term we call amillennialism, and uh, basically they see the description of the millennium in, in Revelations 20 as being metaphorical and not literal. And so uh, Christ is going to reign currently through his church. And so in Roman Catholicism, that's where the authority of the Pope, his term is the vicar of Christ, which means one who's standing in the place of Christ, that he is sitting on Peter's throne, which Peter never had a throne. But nonetheless, this whole uh, thing that revolves around what makes the Vatican and Rome significant is the idea that it's supposed to be literally, Christ's kingdom is literally a physical kingdom upon the planet. So when Jesus said to Pilate, my kingdom isn't of this world, you have to understand that there has been a need to reinterpret even what that statement means. And so over the thousands, 2,000 years, or say about 1,500 years that the Roman Catholic Church has, has been in business, they've created this whole uh, language and liturgy around this belief that the church really is the kingdom of God upon earth, and it's a job of the church, the Roman church, to bring all other churches under its authority. This has led, you know, a lot of people going back to even before the Reformation to view the Roman church as being the precursor of Mystery Babylon, the great horror, the great false religion of the last days. Um, I can't say for sure one way or another. I mean, I don't have a strong view on that, but I would say that they certainly uh, are continuing to move in that direction, even as they become less connected to biblical Christianity, uh, especially under the current Pope, Francis, who uh, I don't believe is a Christian or a true believer in Christ. He uh, embraces just about everything that uh, is outside of Christianity, including the LGBT community and so forth and so on. But the whole idea is that you, what you end up with is this uh, idea that we are to be the ones who are controlling the church. And this is where it's kind of interesting with the New Apostolic Reformation, because they also believe that the church is supposed to take control of all the major organs of government. You know, they call the Seven Mountains Mandate, the idea that the church is supposed to take over government, we're supposed to take over music, education, we take over business, we take over the military, and they go through all the things. They they leave out one, which is they don't take over the world of science and medicine, which I think they've already succeeded in doing. But nonetheless, it's the idea that when Christians are controlling all of these things, then Christ can come and reign upon the throne that we have made and provided for him. And so when we talk about the great apostasy, it's quite possible we're looking at really a, a coalescence of this kind of charismatic renewal and this and new apostolic reformation and Roman Catholicism where they kind of come together. And that may seem really strange to us, but you have to understand that most of the 
these people who are leaders within the NAR have at one time or another gone and visited the Pope. Uh, and uh, you know, one of them very interestingly said to the Pope, what do we do to have to do to come home? And the idea of bringing the church together. So they read things in a certain way. When Jesus says in John that we are all one, they interpret that to mean that all Christians or who, everybody who calls themselves a Christian should be unified. My response is that if I'm a Christian and I'm born again, I'm already in oneness and unity with God the Father and everybody else who's in unity with God the Father. I am part of the universal church by simply virtue of being born into the family of God. I become automatically part of the kingdom of God because of my faith in Christ. So this idea that that has to take on some kind of physical, political, economic, uh, military, governmental form that brings everybody together and we're all on the same page has uh, nothing to do with what the scriptures teach because the Bible very clearly tells us that all of this is going to be consumed and basically the world that we're living in is living under a curse and that curse is not going to go away by somehow us figuring out how to fix the environment. The reality is we live in a world that is going to be going through increasing birth pains, if you will. Um, you begin, as we begin looking at chapter 6 in Revelation, for example, we begin to see these horrific judgments that start falling upon the earth. Uh, in the book of Revelation, there's 21 different judgments. Uh, the, the seven uh, seals are broken, the seven last trumpets, the seven last plagues. All of those represent judgments that God is going to bring upon the earth. And as again, it has a twofold purpose. One, I believe, is to complete the redemption of national Israel. And secondly, I believe it has to do with judgment of Gentile nations, where he speaks of, Jesus spoke of that in Matthew chapter 25, that the nations will be judged for how they have responded to the Jews and the gospel. And so, these are things that I take very literally, and unfortunately, these people who uh, take these other point of views have to take them figuratively. And they, of course, then they become allegorically and interpretive. And the problem with an allegorical approach to things like the scriptures is you can read into them anything you want. I think one of the classic examples I, I saw early in my life was when uh, the music group Peter, Paul, and Mary, some of you are old enough to remember who they were, they wrote a song called Puff the Magic Dragon. And it's this fanciful fairy tale about this dragon who, you know, uh, is <clears throat> featured throughout the song. It's like a right cute song. And I remember I was at a concert with them uh, back in 1967, I believe it was. And I remember... Uh, uh, Peter Stuckey, uh, Paul Stuckey saying, or Peter Yaros was explaining about the song, and he said, uh, the song is a fairy tale. <laughs> and because everybody thought Puff the Magic Dragon was about smoking marijuana. And he says it has nothing to do with drugs. It's just a children's song. And don't tell, make it into anything else. And, you know, most of us sat back and thought, well, we still think it's about drugs because that's where our head was at. But the whole point was they were allegorizing a simple little story and make, and thinking that it said something completely different, seeing symbols and all these things that weren't there. And that's a lot of what happens with these people that begin to stop taking the scriptures in a literal sense and begin to see them in a fanciful, uh, allegorized way. And it ends up leading people to an unhealthy place. Because part of the idea is that we will become like Christ himself. We'll become empowered. And that's why they, one of the terms they have for this whole doctrine is called the manifested sons of God. Now, Paul says that, you know, that the whole creation is waiting for the manifestation of the sons of God, which he's talking about the redemption of the church and the second coming of Christ and all that with his church. They interpret that to be you and me having enough faith that we can begin to replicate the very miracles that Jesus did when he was here upon the earth. And again, it's arrogating to ourself a role that I don't see any place in Scripture. And as I see many of these who've been teaching these for decades, growing old and becoming diseased, and some of them passing away, I wonder why that doesn't undermine that theology. And um, the, maybe the answer is, is because it's financially very beneficial to them, because one of the things that's rooted in their teaching is, by you giving them money, you'll receive a power and blessing in your life.
And as I saw one guy say in, in one of his pitches that he said, this year is a year of the thousand percent blessing. If you give to God a thousand dollars, he will give you a hundred thousand dollars in return. And I thought to myself, why didn't he send to me a thousand dollars and he get the blessing? Well, my check never showed up and well, I'll be honest, he never got mine either because I thought it was nothing but a money raising gig. But the whole issue is we understand that this leads us into these kind of lifestyles and behaviors and commitments that aren't fruitful, don't bring glory to God, but do become unfruitful and damaging to innocent, ordinary people. Well, got one more to left and it'll no longer be so specific to the church itself. We'll talk about the belief of relativism, which is the basically the philosophy du jour that we see in much of the world today, especially in America. See you then.